was the passion of the infant Christ. And I'm like, somebody wrote that title wrong. But the book was written in the 40s. And the woman that wrote it, I've never seen anyone else write about um, our Lord in this way. And she said, if you look at the birth of our Lord, his birth parallels, it complements his death. So she said, we, we're familiar with the passion of the Christ, but there's also the passion of the infant Christ. So she had this, she had this line in her book that I included here that has stayed with me. And she said in her book, um, there are some truths that need to be told over and over again. That's how she starts out her book. There are some truths that need to be told over and over again. When you go to church and the priest uh, consecrates the, the bread and the wine, uh, he recites the gospel account where our Lord says, do this in memory of me. And uh, every week it's a truth that's remembered over and over again. There's um, the gospel readings and the remembrance of our Lord's death. That's a truth that needs to be remembered over and over again. You've heard stories about your family. You've heard stories about maybe the heroics of your great-grandfather or your grandfather in World War I or II, or um, challenges they overcame in their life, or tragedies. And you've heard those stories more than once. If you're like me, your mom's probably told you the story 4,000 times. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, you hear them over and over again, and people love to tell those stories about their family because they're proud or they're thinking of some tragedy in the family. Well, the same thing with Scripture, and one of them is the uh, truths in Scripture. And she says that here. She says, our Lord repeated certain truths about himself. He used certain images of himself over and over again, like the rhyme in a song. She said, repetition not only instills an idea into our minds, but it has the same power that rhyme has to make the idea part of us and dear to us. You hear a story over and over again, you enjoy it. And maybe you start repeating it. You repeat it to your kids. You repeat it to a um, family member or friends, maybe at work, because you enjoy telling those stories about your family or maybe something that happened to you. But there's a difference between Christ's repetition and ours. Our Lord speaks creative words because he is God and because as man he is a poet whom no other poet has ever come near to. His words echo and re-echo through the human heart. Think about the walk to Emmaus where the uh, two disciples said, weren't our hearts burning when he was speaking to us? And uh, think about, um, you know, throughout your week, if you were studying, some of you shared um, your, you know, pondering scripture at different points of the week or sharing it with others. It's just something that stays with you. We, on the other hand, tend to be tedious in repetition, even when the thing that we are saying concerns God and is, and is beautiful in itself. Yet everyone who writes about the life of Christ knows that unless certain things are repeated in every book, he writes much in it or all in it will be almost meaningless to many who read it. The apostles knew Christ as a man, one who whose presence they were remarkably at ease. In the transfiguration, they saw the Lord's glory, the very garments he wore burning with his beauty, just as the world that he had made burns with the beauty that he is. This is God's way with us, to hide and reveal himself at the same time. That's a very profound statement. This is God's way with us, to hide and to reveal himself at the same time. If you'll notice in Scripture, and even right now in the world, I don't know if our Lord does just enough to prove that he exists. He did just enough to prove that um, he was healing the sick and uh, he was the Messiah. He did just enough. It was If you're with us at any time during our Lenten reflections, it was only at the end of his ministry that he was more open about the miracles he did. And that was because the nation was at crisis. They were The crisis was they were going to reject the Messiah. But he, throughout history, and even in our own time, even in nature, there's enough there to show you God exists, but there's enough there for you to make up your mind on your own. And so he hides and reveals himself at the same time because it's a matter of faith. God does not force his secrets upon us. He does not force his love upon us. God approaches gently, often secretly, always in love, never through violence and fear. 
He comes to us as he himself has told us. He comes to us in those whom we know in our own lives. And very often we do not recognize him. He comes in many people we do not like. He comes in all who need what we can give. He comes in all who have something to give us for our great comfort. Some of you shared, uh, Reuben shared this week too. I, he, he shared the gospel with others. Some of you shared reflecting on it in your hearts. He comes in those we love, in our fathers and our mothers, our brothers, our sisters, our friends, our children. Take, for instance, the moments in our lives where we are met with a catastrophe. It's in the midst of such turmoil where we can find him. Oftentimes we are too focused on the disaster that we're not listening to the still small voice as the prophet Elijah had done during his own personal crisis. Disasters are not God's will. They are the result of sin and opposed to God's will. But in his mercy, he does allow the suffering resulting from them, though never the sin that caused them can be caught up into his love and do good for us. Our Lord's first coming on earth was in the midst of a disaster. What was the disaster? It was the world's suffering caused by sin. And it was precisely this that he took hold of in his sufferings and he transformed it by love that he came she says in her uh, forward to her book, how small and gentle the Lord's coming was. He came as an infant. This is another line that stood out to me. Bethlehem is the inscape of Calvary. The passion of Christ is at once revealed and hidden in the infant child, Christ in Bethlehem. So in this uh, study, we're going to do a Cliff Notes version of it. We're going to examine some of the hidden truths between the birth of our Lord and his sufferings and death. We will look for those hidden gems in Scripture that wait, that wait for us to seek and find. May they speak to you, and may God speak through you to others so that you may share that which you have found. We talk about this often in our class when we do our closing prayer. No one lights a lamp, our Lord says, and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. So... Um, I'm going to go through these fairly briefly. It's online for you to study in more detail. But these were some of the things that were mentioned in her book. As a matter of fact, before I do that, I'm going to show you. I know Ryan's online here. And uh, last week, or not last week, but um, last year, uh, Ryan had got got a copy of this book i think ricky did too you can find it online that's the book right there the passion of the infant christ wage you get five dollars off no thank you um you can find it online there but these are some of the things that she mentions in the text she talks about the crib of christ showing the incarnation embraces its limitless tenderness even in the animals and she says in one of her observations, just as Adam's fall involved the whole animal world in suffering, the birth of the new Adam brought its blessing to animals, paying fallen man's enormous debt of pity to be subburdened, drawing them into the service and even close to the suffering of their creator and Lord. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Problem of Pain, he's like, why do animals suffer? They don't deserve it. And he says they, they suffer because it was man's responsibility to care for animals and because he uh sinned it caused a consequence to animals so she mentions the proximity of animals in the service of our lord but being close to him in birth too in parallelism to the suffering of animals because of the sin of adam for which our lord came to restore our salvation then uh she mentions in one of her other observations on the night of our Lord's birth, when he first gave his body to us, lambs were brought to Christ on the night before he died. When he gave us his body in the Holy Communion, he kept the ritual of the Paschal lamb. Um, I shared this with you before. The Nubian donkey has a cross on its back. Because it was said that the breeds of donkeys that carried Jesus to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, uh, seeing the tragic event of the Lord's crucifixion, the donkey wished that he had been able to carry the cross for our Lord and bear his burden. And it said that uh, in the shadow of the cross, this was put on the donkey. That's a tradition. 
obviously. But in um, in one of her observations, she said, a donkey stood by the manger and Christ rode on a donkey on the eve of his passion, which we are told is the reason why every donkey has a cross marked out in soft fur on its gray back. On Calvary, our Lord is poor with the poverty of destitution. In Bethlehem, our Lord is poor with the poverty of destitution. He is deprived of his home in Nazareth. He had to travel to Bethlehem. The cradle was made ready for him, is empty. And then our Lord says during his ministry, when he's going up to Jerusalem um, to suffer, he says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. On Calvary, our Lord was naked, stripped of his garments and of all that he had. In Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, he came in the humblest of his infancy, naked and stripped of all that he had of his majesty from above. On Calvary, he was stretched and straightened and fastened down to the cross. In Bethlehem, he was stretched out and straightened and fastened in swaddling bands. On Calvary, he was lifted up helpless and held up for men to look upon. In Bethlehem, he was lifted up helpless to be gazed upon. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. On Calvary, he was laid upon a wooden cross. In Bethlehem, he was laid within a wooden manger. By the cross stood Mary, his mother. By the crib knelt Mary, his mother. He was crucified outside the city wall. He was born outside of his own village and crowded out of Bethlehem. At his birth, our Lord was called King of the Jews. Remember, where is he that is King of the Jews? At his death, he was called King of the Jews. The claim to be king threatened his life in Bethlehem. The claim to be king cost him his life in Jerusalem. Three times the mysterious title is heavy with doom at his birth, at his trial, at his death. There's the three... Uh, times when the wise men came from the east uh, before Pilate and then when they put uh, the description over his head he was mocked at his birth by Herod Herod was a pioneer of those hypocrites who for their own pride would slay the Christ child in the heart of the world Go and diligently inquire after the child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I also may come and adore him. He was mocking him because he didn't want to, and all of Jerusalem was in, was troubled because they were afraid of what Herod would do, and that came to fruition with the slaughter of the innocents. He was mocked at his birth by Herod. He was mocked at his death by the Roman soldiers. In both cases, the derision was a mockery of adoration. The Roman soldiers were the pioneers of those egoists who, for passing entertainment and sens sensation, ridicule, and blaspheme the suffering Christ in the heart of men, motivated like so much cruelty today by group mentality. At Bethlehem, myrrh was brought to him, and myrrh was brought to anoint his body for burial. Each time it was brought by a rich man who came by night first, but one of the wise men, by one of the wise men, and then by Nicodemus. At Bethlehem, he was wrapped in swaddling bands and laid in a manger. On Calvary, he was wrapped in swaddling bands and laid in a tomb. He was born in a stranger's cave, and he was buried in a stranger's grave. Both of those had been made for their owners. They were not made for Christ. All that had been prepared for him, God had set aside. God chose what men should give to his son, and he chose things so shaped or worn to the giver's life that they had become part of them. So warm with the giver's touch, they could not be given without the giving of self. Christ accepted those offerings in which self was given, not what man had made for him, but what made what man had made for himself. The gifts with self at the core involving the surrender of the giver's will, even in the choice of the gift. 
We are we are often surprised when after we have offered God several litanies a day and a pest of little mortifications, he chooses instead something that is really ourselves, or maybe it's our solitude, for example, or the feeling of love, or as is very frequent now, our home. I, I went through this paragraph pretty quickly, but the author is saying there were people in the life of Jesus that gave him things. They, he was there in the manger. They gave him the grave, the grave site. And our Lord accepted some of these things. There were other things he didn't accept in his, in his ministry, but he accepted some of them. And the author is saying here that we, we say these prayers to God and we offer these sacrifices, but it's something small in our lives or something that we don't expect that God accepts more than those things that we think he really wants. One of them that really stood out to to me is that one right there after a long day don't you just kind of want to be alone by yourself <laughs> and sometimes the demands of life require that you're not and you have to make that sacrifice maybe it's going to the store when you don't want to maybe it's uh, doing something for your family when all you want to do is sit in front of the tv and and uh, die for 10 hours until the morning comes <laughs> And so in your love for your family and your responsibilities, you put aside your exhaustion, just like Joseph, and, and you do that. And God honors that more than us saying a prayer or, or going to church, because that was something of an action. And it is what God chooses that kindles in the crucible and burns the flame of love. In Bethlehem, Christ slept his first sleep in his mother's arms. And on Calvary, Christ slept his last sleep in his mother's arms. In the inscape of Calvary, in the passion of the infant Jesus, we behold his resurrection from the dead. How so? Uh, the author says, Christ came out of the darkness of the womb. He was the light of the world. He came to give the world life. The life of the whole world burnt in the tiny flame of an infant's life. The, whole, the life of the whole world burnt in the tiny flame of an infant's life. It began the age-long fight with death in the least and the frailest that human nature can be, in the helplessness, the littleness, the blindness of an infant. Life prevailed. The light of the world shone in darkness. At Bethlehem, love and death met in the body of Christ, and love prevailed. Over and over again in every human life, love and death meet face to face. No human power or splendor or strength, no material might or wealth can overcome death, the death of the soul. But if the life in the soul is the tiniest spark of the life of Christ, love prevails and death is overcome in us. Now Christ came out of the darkness of the tomb. He came back from the helplessness and blindness and the silence of death. And his feet that walked on earth bore the wounds of death. And his hands that touched the flowers and the grass bore the wounds of death. He had overcome the world. He had died all our deaths and had overcome death. All over the world and generation after generation, men rose from the dead all over the world. Everywhere there was resurrection, mourning in the heart of man. The author likens the birth of our Lord as a type of death coming out of the womb and, and coming to life and being the light of the world and then coming out of the tomb on, on uh, the first day of the week and being the light of the world and the salvation to men. At Bethlehem, angels stood among the flocks and around the stable door. And they said, uh, you know, go see where the child is. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. There were angels there. In Jerusalem, angels stood beside the empty tomb. The message of the incarnation is peace. On the hills above Bethlehem, the angel's song was peace. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men of goodwill. And peace was the word of the risen Christ. His greeting to the world was peace to you. Peace be to you. My peace I give to you. At the nativity, it was to the shepherds that the angels brought the message of peace and shepherds who came first to the divine child. On the night before our Lord suffered, Christ, keeping the feast of the Paschal Lamb, gave his peace, the peace of the Lamb of God. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. 
When the season of the risen Christ had come, it was to a shepherd that Christ came, entrusting the giving of his love and life and peace to him. He came to Peter. He came to the shepherd of his own flock, the shepherd for all time of his shearlings and his sheep, and he appointed him, and he told Peter, feed my sheep. So um, I'm going to go over very briefly here. There was some descriptions here about how the animals in the stable mirrored what happened in the fall of, of man and the sufferings of the animals. There was the description of uh, the lambs there at his birth and the Paschal lamb being kept there at uh, the Last Supper. There was a description of, of the work of the donkeys carrying Mary here and there and them being there and then our Lord riding on the donkey uh, during Palm Sunday. There was a description of our Lord being bound and, sw and swaddled and uh, stretched out on the cross and how those two things related to each other. There was a uh, description of how he was called the king of the Jews at his birth and king of the Jews at his death. And at his birth, it caused uh, persecution. And at, at, at the end of his life, it caused his death. He was mocked at his birth. He was mocked at the end of his life. Uh, myrrh was brought to him at the beginning and it was brought to him at the end. Swaddling clothes laid in a manger. He was also put in these garments and laid in a tomb. Both were borrowed. He was born in a stranger's cave. He was buried in a stranger's grave. His mother was there when he was born. His mother was there when he had died. He slept his first death in his mother's arms and his last death. His birth and his death. Angels were there at the beginning. Angels were there at the end. Angels offered peace at the beginning. Our Lord offered peace at the end. <clears throat> Shepherds were there at the beginning. And at the end, he entrusts the church to a shepherd. Feed my sheep, Peter. So you're, I'm going to put this on the mobile app so it's mobile for you. But what I'd like for you to do is to also remember that if you come over here to um, the uh, website and you click on the top where it says more, you're going to see it says seasonal reflections. You click on Advent Reflections. You've got everything that we just discussed right there. You click on the title. It's going to bring up the whole study for you. You can print it out. You can uh, share it with others. You can text it to them. You can share the app with them. You can go through here and pick something out that stood out to you. Maybe one or two things. This is the homework this week. Pick one or two things that stood out to you in dad's study, in this study, um, and share them with others. I mean, how many people knew that the birth of our Lord mirrored his death? So bring something up on that with, with someone this week. Just pick one thing and share it with someone. And, um, and uh, evangelize. Now let me ask, let me just ask you this very briefly. Uh, we went through that twice. Were there was there something that stood out to you more than the others? Which one of those par comparisons resonated with you the most? The myrrh. Uh, for Ryan, it was the myrrh. Yeah, because I think about it obviously as a gift that was presented to him at his birth, obviously from uh, the Magi, right? But then I didn't really connect it at his resurrection. I mean, right before it, at his burial, I didn't really think about it, but that really stood out to me. Anyone else? Born, and the cave that was given to him, died. And those are the things he accepted. And his father told him when he was born, and Every few mothers hold their children when they, yeah. I mean, it happens, but I mean, historically, it doesn't happen as, as often as, yeah. 
assessment. Usually, I'm something that you guys don't teach you. You want to have a really Joe? Joe? Dad? Come on. Hit me. We're going to begin. I don't want you to begin anywhere. I just want you to hey. pick one. And one of yours or one of mine? One, one, one from here. Don't forget we're fathers, please. You know, from Bill's yeah, obedience, yeah. I mean, obedience to God and knowing when to obey. Yeah. Skyla, did one of these stand out to you? Um, I don't know. I just, I don't think I'm really interested in what I've heard and what I've said. Um, when you, uh, this happens for comedians, this happens for teachers, this happens in your personal life, but I'm telling you from the viewpoint of teaching is when you put a lesson together or a comedian, when a comedian puts a set together, they, um, they always have, uh, a comedian or a, uh, Instructor, they a comedian says, "I've got this joke. It's going to kill. Everyone's going to laugh, and it's really not that joke. It's the joke that they least think people are going to laugh at. That, and they're like, oh, you find that funny? It's the same thing for teaching. You're like, I put this lesson together. This one part is fascinating, and then you find out that uh, the people in the lesson that uh, no, that's all right, and then they find something else, and you're like, oh, that you like that? Oh." And it reminded me of that part where it says our Lord picks his gifts. And during his life, there were certain things he accepted. And uh, I think of that. It's like, oh, I went to church and I and I said uh, all of these prayers. And it's like, well, that's not what God wanted. He wanted you in your exhaustion to be patient and to do this. Or he wanted you to evangelize to that person that is a little obnoxious and is asking for a dollar and is kind of out of it and is not carrying a sentence coherently. He wanted you to give your time to that person. Um, and so that's what I think about is, okay, what are the things that I think God wants and what are the things that God really wants? And so our Lord says that in the gospel accounts too. He says, these people give me lip service. That's not what I want. And he's, he talked about his mercy and, and love and, and things that he had wanted. God is asking for you to do or to accomplish what you're saying. So uh, let's go back to uh, I always go back to what Omerio says, where he's like, I really like Lenten reflections. Well, we kind of they kind of go together here in, in a lot of what we're studying. It's a complementary of each other. But there's things that I want to share with you now, and I'm not going to share with you because they're Lenten reflections. And I know some of these we revisit every year. And I think it's good for a refresher. But we've got two or three lessons lined up for Lent that we have never covered before <laughs> that I think are really going to resonate with you. Next week, we're going to go through the uh, life of St. Joseph. We're going to look at uh, his life in, in several different ways. And uh, I thought when I was putting that study together, because I was working on it this week in preparation for next week, I thought, why haven't we ever covered this before? This guy connects with us more than... I think a lot of the characters, because I'm like, we've been there before, dealing with family, dealing with stress, dealing with do this. And it's like, oh, I don't know if I should be doing that. Um, so we're going to examine that next week.